Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by the Nyaradzo Group. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today, I'm in conversation with Pritchard Marco, an entrepreneur, business development professional, and startup advisor. Enjoy this inspirational and informative conversation. Richard, Chad Marco, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you so much for having me. What a great pleasure. You know, we, sh we, must, we should tell the audience how you got to be here. You, you were a bit reluctant, uh, but you, you, I think you put your hand up by commenting on a tweet. Uh, and and uh, there was a whole noise on Twitter that you should come onto the show. I'm delighted that you finally changed your mind and decided to come on, onto the show. Thank you so much. So... Proceed, please. Yeah, so, you know, I always usually work from behind the scenes. So when the opportunity came through, you know, it was sort of, uh, I was taking a little back, bit of back, but uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, you gave me the nudge. Uh, for me, I consider that my uh, Bafun Dimpofu moment. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So who is Chad Marco? Uh, well, Chad Marco is a, is a young man. Uh, was born in 1996 in rural Shamba. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, uh, business development consultant. Um, so that sort of sums up my story. Um, I was born in rural Shamba, in, as obviously as I pointed out, in 1996. And then I grew up somewhat between uh, rural Shamba and Darare Glenview, where my father had a house. Um, and I was born in a family of nine. And um, you know, upon my father's death, we then discovered that we were 13. Uh, so I come from a very big family, uh, and I'm just that guy who uh, is there solving problems for people. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, whenever there's a complex business problem, I'm there, and I'm, you know, I'm doing my work. Mm. You know? Cor correct me. So you are an entrepreneur, you are a banker, you are a business development professional, and you're very passionate about uh, startups. Absolutely. Um, I've been passionate about entrepreneurship and startup for a very long time. Uh, my first job, formal employment, was working for a pension fund, and I was part of their property. That's the pension, the, the uh, construction industry pension fund. That was your first job, yeah? Yes. So wow. I, was, I was working for the construction industry pension fund, and I was uh, part of managing their property portfolio. And when you're managing a property portfolio, you're interacting with entrepreneurs. Uh, so as I was inter interacting with those entrepreneurs, you know, um, most of them would come in, apply for an office uh, a month down the line, two months down the line, they're struggling to pay renters and so forth. So I always wanted to help them fix their problems because them performing as a client would also help me collect my rent and be able to meet my targets. Right. So I think that's when I sort of fully discovered that, you know, I really wanted to be an entrepreneur. But I trace back my entrepreneurial roots to my father, uh, Peter Chipokosa Marco the late. Um, and so my dad was... Um, when we were growing up, we thought my dad was a pharmacist. Mm -hmm. You know, we always said when we were asked in school, what does your father do? We'd say, he's a pharmacist. But my dad wasn't a pharmacist. My dad was actually a sales rep in the pharmacy. Uh, and it was only after my dad Which died. Which pharmacy was that? It was Lancaster Pharmacy. Okay. Yeah, it was a big uh, pharmacy chain back in the day. Um, so when he uh, died, my mother then, you know, sort of set us down and then she was telling us about the story of my dad. And we discovered my dad wasn't even a pharmacy. He was just a salesman in a pharmacy. But he was so brilliant at, at, at what he did. And, and we always thought he had a bottomless pit of money because, I mean, he was like one of the pioneers of rural industrialization. Uh, he set up the first um, uh, metal fabrication workshop uh, from Bindura going to the border. So in my centrum, Bindura going to the border, my dad was, was, was doing, you know, scotch cuts and things like that. So for me, you know, it's a whole mix of things. So he had a job and he was doing this on the, on the sideline. He was doing this on the sideline. But for us, we thought, you know, this guy must be really managed because, uh, you know, we, I mean, we're seeing him doing business and so forth. And it was exciting for us as a kid, as kids. And it was exciting, particularly for me as a kid, to, to watch him, you know, pursue his entrepreneurial ventures. Mm, mm. And then as I grew up, you know, a lot of influences came into the picture. The pension fund job. My brother, Plot, who quit his job after reading uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, and I gather that book had a big impact on you. Um, talk, talk to me about that. 
Absolutely. Mm. Uh, it had a big impact on me because I think the entrepreneurial gene had always been inside me. Uh, but, you know, when my brother Plot read that book, uh, it changed him. And so I, d I had to read that book. So I went in and then I, 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 I read the book and it was mind blowing uh, when, when Robert Kiyosaki speaks about the rich dad and the poor dad and the different attributes that make them. And uh, he's a rich dad being an entrepreneurial man. Mm. Uh, for me, I was like, I want to be that guy. So I recall one of those days when I was coming from college in Bindura, we had hiked a, 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 a truck. We were like sitting in the in the pan of that uh, baki, yeah. and uh, we were coming to Harare, and you know I had my colleagues, and we say, you know what, I don't want to work for anyone. I want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, but you know, a lot of things then changed. So yeah, that book had a lot of influence on me. Mm. Yeah. Now let's go back to uh, where you went to school, um, uh, Chad. Where did you go to school? Yeah. So I went to school. My first uh, experience at whatever one would call school was in 1992 during the drought era uh, and I was in rural Shamba Madziwa to be precise. And my first um, you know, time in what appeared to be a classroom, though we were not learning anything, we were being given porridge and beans because it was during the, the drought, drought era. Mm. Yeah, so it was a, it was a, it, it was a feeding scheme uh, in, 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 in Gora Madziwa. You know, I, I always want to talk about that. So that was my first uh, experience in school. And then I later went to primary So you school. were in this feeding scheme because your parents couldn't uh, provide the food that you required. Is that, is that, is that the case? Not no. necessarily. Mm. Uh, it was 1992. It was the drought. drought so yeah. anyone who stayed in the rural areas would obviously be invited to bring their kids over. So my mom, one of the things that she always wanted to do was she didn't want us to appear any different from the kids uh -huh. in, in, in our rural oh, community. So it always, you know, would always be part of whatever activities were going on. So that was my first school. Mm -hmm. And then I went to uh, Glenview 8 Primary School uh, in, in, in Glenview, Harare. Um, and then after that, I went to um, uh, the biggest school in Zimbabwe, uh, which happens to be Glenview <laughs> High One. <laughs> so, right. so what makes it the biggest school is that yeah. they've literally got 20 classes per stream. Wow. Uh, so you, you think about your form one, they've got 20 classes, A to T. Form two, they've got 20 classes, form three, form four. Wow. Um, so, well, I don't know, maybe because Glenview is big, I would suppose uh, so much. When I went for form one, uh, we could not even be accommodated on the school. So we had to go to a satellite school, uh, which was Glenview 6 Primary School. Mm. So mm. here we were, we had moved from, from, from primary school, and then I'd gone to secondary school. Then they'd send me back to primary school because I was now operating or at least learning from Glenview 6 Primary School. Yeah. And then we eventually came back. Then after Glenview High 1, I then went to High Field High 1. Um, where, you know, it was an amazing ex experience. It was a different environment, a relatively smaller school, more intimate, if I may put it that way. And then thereafter, I went to uh, university in uh, Bindura University. Mm. Then, you know, I've done uh, some postgraduates uh, and other qualifications elsewhere. Mm. But yeah, that, mm. that sort of sums up my, my, mm. my school experience. In, in interesting. So you, you, like you've said, you work for the construction industry uh, pension fund and then you join Astro Mobile Africa. Then you have a turning point in your life where you decided that uh, you were going to quit your job and become an entrepreneur. Talk to us about the thinking process, why you thought, let me quit my job, let me become an entrepreneur. What was the attraction uh, to entrepreneurship? Talk to us about that, that experience. Yeah, so the attraction to entrepreneurship it had been a long time coming because of the things that I highlighted earlier. But uh, in 2011, I was watching TV, sitting in, in my house, and I was watching TV, and then I saw they were talking about the environment, and then I said, wait a minute, this guy's what they're talking about is not happening here. So they're talking about the environment in the context of business is in mainstreaming uh, green practice. Mm. So then I, you know, I thought to myself, you know, I want to start something that speaks about the environment, but it's not event-based. Like, you know, on a certain day, you go and plant trees. I want to talk about the environment in the context of if you are you know, taking care of the environment, you've got to make profit. So it's mm. people, planet, profit, that sort of thing. So that was the first time that I actually went and did an entrepreneurial venture. So I started an enterprise called High Green Africa. Uh, it was a non-profit, it was a social enterprise. And then that was in 2011. And then in 2010, we did a conference, which I believe to be the biggest uh, business and environment conference since, I mean, Zimbabwe mm. was founded. Uh, so we brought business and and stakeholders in the environmental uh, management space 
to try and bring them to dialogue so that they can seek out and find means and ways of uh, you know, mainstreaming green practice in a manner that's profitable to business, mm, mm. but also sustainable to the environment. So that was the first time. So I was doing all of this whilst I was employed. So the entrepreneurial bug was always in me, bugging me somewhere there. And then later on in 2013, I had a, I had a, I had a publishing company. So we were publishing uh, a magazine called Zimpression Magazine. And then we, we went about that. But there was never really, you know, an aggressive uh, nature in the way in which I was pursuing my entrepreneurial ventures because, you know, I had a paycheck. I was working for a pension fund. I had a good job. Mm. You know, I had, a, I had a big office and I had all of those things that, you, you know, if someone at my age would, would dream of. So um, come um, the time when, 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 when uh, there was a bit of a promotion at construction industry, the iron of it. There was a bit of promotion at the construction industry pension fund, which didn't align with my ambitions. Mm. I went to the CEO and I said, uh, can I be retained where I am? Because it sort of you know, didn't align with my ambitions. There was a marginal increase in my income, and I thought you know, what, I wanted to pursue and curate my, my career in a certain way. Uh, unfortunately, the CEO says, you know, we've already advertised for your, for your former job. So I said to him, ah, you know what, thank you. I'd been headhunted by Astro for about a year. And then I said, thank you. I think, you know, you know, I've saved my time and I've done fairly well. Uh, and so I had to leave for Astro. But my exit into Astro now was now me, you know, becoming full circle, becoming an entrepreneur, because Astro was a startup. Mm. So I knew, you know, moving from a very established entity and going into a startup, mm. you know, there would obviously be a change in terms of culture, in terms of a lot of things. So, um, yeah, I went and then served Astro and then served there briefly. And then I had a conversation with the CEO again and I told him, you know what, you know, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I think this is my time. So that's when I then left and uh, went to co-found a manufacturing business. And uh, what is that experience like? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you discover that entrepreneurship in itself, uh, in theory, uh, is a fraction of the entrepreneurship in practice. And there is no book or, uh, I don't know, there's no lecture really that can prepare you for the entrepreneurial journey. And so for me, um, Quitting work and, and, and deciding finally that, you know, I wanted to go full time into entrepreneurship. Uh, it was exciting in the context that I finally had to, you know, be unboxed and be able to execute my ideas uh, without, you know, the bureaucracy of, of an established entity, without, you know, just being able to implement my ideas. So that was the great feeling. Mm. And then come the reality of the enterprise. So when we got in and we set up our factory with a factory in Rua, we set up a factory and we were renting a very large factory. What were you manufacturing? By we were manufacturing, uh, we were in the detergents and edible oils industry. Mm -hmm. Our first product was soap, green bar soap. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had ambitions, uh, I'll tell you all about it, but yeah. we, had, we had great ambitions to do uh, massive, massive things. So we got in, we we're renting this huge factory. Uh, and then we discover uh, on the day, first day that we get there, we're trying to bring our machines in. We discover first day that we get here that uh, there's a huge, electricity bill. Mm. So we went for like two weeks without being connected by, by Zessa because we had to go back and forth and negotiate how we're going to extinguish that bill. Um, so that was the, the first sort of baptism of fire. Baptism of fire because mm. we thought, you know, we're getting in first day, we're manufacturing after a week, we're selling, you know, with all of these excitable <laughs> uh, ambitions. Uh, but reality was telling us a different story and I was also learning a great deal. So for me, it was one of the most enriching experiences for me. So yeah, we get in there, we discover there's a Zesa bill, and then the next thing, uh, we make our product, Zesa is connected finally, we make our product, our first batch comes out, you know, it was terrible. You know, our first batch was terrible, so we had to remake that first batch. So you can imagine now you're sort of bootstrapping, you're having to remake the first batch. Uh, so you're How having- How had you funded the first batch? Uh, well, we had, um, we had come across, uh, we had come along as uh, colleagues, and then okay. we, had, we, had, we had financed, uh, the, 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 the business as, as, mm. as a collective. Mm. We had sort of uh, done a little bit of a private equity transaction yeah. as early on as that. We brought in some couple of guys to bring in a little bit of money mm -hmm. to finance the business. So yeah, we ran our batch. Uh, it comes out terrible. We have to remake the batch. We still have a little bit of working capital on the side. We, we put it towards remaking the batch. Mm -hmm. uh, now we are incurring double the cost in, right. terms, of, in terms of making just one, one, one batch of production. So um, we thought, you know, we were past the troubles, but that wasn't it. We we're actually getting into a more whole, trouble. More <laughs> trouble. So now we want to sell to our mainstream because our business model was structured around selling into mainstream. Because there are a lot of manufacturers, I'll tell you. 
who are manufacturing products, but they're just selling to matak shops and all that sort of thing. Mm. But we wanted to go in mainstream. So that was my, my, my big vision, because I was sort of steering the vision. Mm. Um, that was my big vision. And then we get in there, we, we, we approach these big, uh, big um, uh, retailers. The big retailers give us a checklist. And mm. amongst that checklist, there's one that says you've got to be VAT, um, uh, um, you've got to be VAT compliant. Um, so we think that should be easy. We go to Zimra. We want to be VAT compliant. Yeah. We want to volunteer to pay tax. And then Zimra tells us that um, you must have at least traded for six months. But we haven't traded for six months. Mm -hmm. So what else can we do? They tell us you've got to have a contract from your retailers. What do we do? We go mm. back to the retailer. Retailer, Zimra says we've got to have a contract with you for them to give us a, a VAT so that we're VAT compliant. They mm -hmm. tell us, no, we can't do that. We've got a checklist. So here we are, we, we've got a business. We are being somewhat, we felt we were being punished by Zimra mm. because they felt we didn't sort of qualify, but we wanted to volunteer to pay tax because mm. we wanted to go mainstream. Um, so yeah, those are some of the challenges that we encountered, uh, but eventually we got past those. Uh, uh, we got past those, but also there were new challenges that were brewing somewhere in the, yeah. in the space. But it was, for me, that entrepreneurial uh, journey was, was in the you, you ended up shutting it down, didn't you? We ended up. Why did you shut it down? So we, we encountered uh, a series of, of challenges. Uh, one of them at some point in time was finance. And then we finally got money from a micro lender. Because, you know, some of the challenges that we were facing at that particular point in time was that uh, we had not traded long enough, mm. right? Um, I think that was almost like a year in. Mm. We then got money from a micro lender. Um, but this micro lender had a sort of complex relationship because they sort of owed me money. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they came in and said, no, but I, you know, I don't have that money yet, but I've got this money. You know, we can help you as a business. Micro so lender is short term, isn't it? Micro lender is short term. High interest rates? Very high interest rate. But the biggest challenge then was not just that they were a micro lender. There was some changes that were taking place in the, in the business environment. Uh, I think the, um, the one is to one exchange rate was yeah, being tested. Yeah, yeah. There were a lot of things that were happening in the market space that sort of shook the business. But chief amongst them was the, 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 the money that we got from the micro lender. Then we tried to acquire raw materials because we would always acquire raw materials you know, just in time because we're not a big entity yeah. to you know, be acquiring six weeks a, a month's worth of raw materials. So we'd always acquire raw materials just in time. So we got this money, we're about to acquire raw materials. There's a, there's a crisis in the, in the market space. Because our raw materials were, not, were, were a byproduct of the edible oils industry. And the guys in the edible oils industry were also making our product. So whenever there was a shortage of the material, they would supply themselves and then- Compete with you. And then compete with us. So we were sort of in a predicament and then we're struggling to get raw materials. And then we had uh, a whole lot of other challenges that unfolded thereafter. And uh, eventually, we decided to dissolve to dissolve the business. But uh, I walked away. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what lessons did you learn from that experience? So I think the first lesson is obviously <laughs> uh, there's a whole world of difference between um, theory in terms of entrepreneurship and what you then encounter when you are practicing it. Yeah. That was one. And then the other thing that I learned is that you have to structure your partnerships quite well, you've got to make everything upfront because when you sort of partner and your visions are not aligning, mm -hmm. uh, you are bound to encounter challenges. The other um, lesson that I learned is also in terms of, um, you know, toning down your ambition a little bit, you know, because when we went and got money from a micro lender, I mean, we knew we had, there was demand in the market. Uh, so our business didn't quite forward because there wasn't any demand. Mm -hmm. But there were also other challenges that we were not fully aware of. So now when I look at things, when I look at anything, I'm always looking at things from the, the broadest uh, uh, point of view mm. uh, one can find. So those are some of the lessons that I actually learned. Here. So at the moment, you, uh, you basically almost have uh, two jobs. Eh? You are the managing partner for uh, Adeyedu Kin, and you're also country manager for Energy Nearing. Uh, talk to me about uh, those responsibilities. Okay, yeah. So I'm a managing partner of uh, Abiedu. Mm -hmm. uh, so Abiedu is a quote quote word which means kin. Uh -huh. So Abiedu. Oh, Abiedu. Kin. Yes, okay, absolutely. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it's Abiedu kin. Mm -hmm. uh, kin is, yeah. it, it's English from Abiedu. Yeah. So uh, that it's just a bit of a combination of those two words. Right. Uh, so with Abiedu kin, my work um, primarily involves uh, 
uh, advising and helping um, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, SMEs and established businesses develop um, bespoke concrete actionable strategies for better access to markets and finance. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means I assist you from your very, um, you know, someone who's starting up who wants to literally get into business and says, how do I start? Mm -hmm. I assist them. And I assist those who are, you know, navigating troubled waters in terms of their business. I come in there, you know, I, I, I advise them, create strategies that sort of uh, bust and, and, and help them sell and navigate some of those difficult, uh, thorny issues in business. Uh, so that's the side of Abiyadu Kin. We also mm -hmm. help uh, businesses that are trying to fundraise by creating linkages between uh, the, those who are trying to fundraise and those who've got the resources. Right. Yeah, that's Abiyadu Kin. And then with uh, energy engineering, uh, we call ourselves a clean energy company. Uh, we are an EPCM, which means we do everything from uh, procurement, from design, mm. uh, to operation and, and maintenance, to um, everything that's uh, uh, included in terms of uh, doing installations. Uh, we're also moving a little bit into EPCM plus F, which means we do financing. Mm -hmm. So we've got a little bit of uh, financing partners who are coming in and, and, and allowing us to be able to help our clients uh, go green mm -hmm. and, and have a more reliable, uh, cleaner source of energy uh, without uh, footing in any sort of capex. Introducing the self-service portal. Nyarazo has launched its very own self-service portal. This platform is available to Nyarazo clients via the Nyarazo Group website. Now you have your policy information readily available for your convenience. The self-care platform enables you to view your policy details, lives assured, policy plan type, and contact details. Edit your information, email, residential address, phone number, view your payment history, and outstanding balance. You are now able to make payments using mobile money platforms, EcoCash, and OneMoney. You can get updated Sawira Berudi change rates. The portal also provides a summary of the product offerings and a life insurance, which includes the six pack, skull pack, and SIP policies. You can get a quote on the different policy types and apply online. Visit nyarazo.co.zw and enjoy autonomy in your interaction with Nyarazo. So, so you, um, we, we had uh, um, uh, uh, Nyarazo uh, Liwayo uh, here with us, and uh, she's, I think, one of our favorite, uh, uh, you know, uh, startups, uh, and we absolutely love what she, what she does. You are actually her consultant, um, and you're also working with, uh, is it Glytam or Glitam? How do you pronounce that? Glytam, okay. yeah. So talk to me about how you choose your clients, like Yanaya, mm -hmm. uh, Yanaya Lifestyle, uh, and what you, what kind of services you provide for to them? Oh yeah, so the, the Yanaya story is actually quite funny. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing a series of uh, workshops online, uh, free workshops. I had a couple of colleagues who would come in and then they would speak about entrepreneurship. And one of the people that happened to be in the room at that point in time was, was, was Nyari. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, she, She's an aggressive person who, you know, she pushes herself, you know, she's always looking she's for She's amazing. She's amazing, yeah. So she comes in and then um, uh, she comes into the room and then she hears that, uh, you know, it's unconventional stuff that we're giving because, I mean, we are entrepreneurs. So when we talk about entrepreneurship, it's not something that's out of the book. We simplify to a level where an entrepreneur can actually relate and say, you know what, this person must actually know what they're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. So, and then a, a friend of mine, uh, Simbarashi Nyamadzao, then uh, connected us. And then she came through, she gave me a call, and then she asked, you know, if we could meet. And then I told her, I charged per hour to meet. <laughs> and, and surprisingly, because if, to tell you how aggressive she is, she came through and she, she, she paid for her first meeting. Mm. And after her first meeting, she knew that, you know, I was the, I was, I was, I was the, 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 the guy to help her uh, navigate the, the difficult processes in terms of her business and also to push her towards growth. Mm. And I'm glad that during the time that we've worked together, the business. You, are you still working together? We are actually working together. Wow. Uh, uh, the business is... And is, you charge per hour? No, I no longer charge per hour, okay. obviously. <laughs> <laughs> the first meeting is obviously to see if someone is serious enough to yeah. engage. Uh, because it's, you know... You I know. hope you're not charging us per hour here. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely not. Right. So the thing is that, I mean, in business, you... you, you the, 
you've got to be good at saving someone. Right. Um, I know that some people are good at saving everybody, but mm. I, I feel like I've got to be good at saving someone. Mm. So for me, that's part of you know me finding out if that mm. someone is is that, is that someone that, whom mm. I want to do business with. So I'm glad that we. I'm going to hold you there because that's a very important. Uh, what you've just said there is very important. They, they, we have a culture. Um, I think as Africans, you know, that uh, we, we tend to give our services for free. And when you, when you, when you want to charge, people think that uh, you are greedy or um, um, overstepping. Is that your sense? I mean, I'm impressed by the fact that you say to, Yara, to Nyarazo Liwai of Yanaya Lifestyle, um, she calls you on the yes. phone, I charge so much an hour, can we meet? And she comes. And she comes is, is, is that the thing that gets done? It, it's, I think um, the bulk of, of, of the people that I tell that I charge, they don't come through, yeah. but I'm glad they don't come through. Yeah. Uh, because like I mentioned, I mean, I've got to be good at saving someone. And if they don't uh, 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 fit the description of my customer archetype, yeah. uh, challenges are, uh, you know, I may get in there for free and then they may not actually value the work that I'm doing. Yeah. But for those who put their teeth in the game, they actually value the work that I'm doing and Absolutely. they see the results and they're willing to to implement when yeah. we suggest and make recommendations. So yes, for me, the consultancy didn't actually start with me registering a business. Like I mentioned, when I was at the pension fund, I had all of these clients uh, from very big uh, you know, organizations to very small organizations. And the approach that I always took was that I always took an approach whilst being firm uh, uh, in terms of collecting rentals and things like that. The approach that I always took was to say, how can we help you grow? How can we help you move forward? And, and in trying to help those clients move forward, I always had, you know, a flood of entrepreneurs in my office. Mm. You know, uh, people will tell you that my, my construction as office was always filled up with entrepreneurs who were coming in for advice. So I was always advising these entrepreneurs, um, but I was doing it for free because I was employed. Mm. And I didn't think that, you know, um, that's what I was supposed to do. But I always had a philosophy that says, whatever is supposed to make you rich is well within your reach. Mm. But for me, it was well within my reach, but mm. then I just could not see it. And I was offering it for free. And sometimes people would not value the, 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 the advice. And because it's for free. Because it's for free. So they'll probably come through, uh, get a, you know, the, the, the advice for free, and then go to someone else and pay when I was just creating value, mm. but I was creating value, but I just didn't know how to extract mm. the value out of it. So mm. now I create value, mm. and, and when I distribute the value, I make yeah. sure that I also extract something. So you, apart from Yanaya, you are working with uh, Need Energy, uh, Transaction Advisor for uh, a number of IPPs. You're very, strong, very big in, uh, yeah. uh, in the green energy renewable uh, s sector. Wh which other clients are you working with there? Yeah, uh, so I'm working with uh, a couple of clients actually, uh, who are um, primarily startups. Uh, but one of my most exciting clients was uh, an entity called um, 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 Value Chain Farming Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, Value Chain Farming Africa went on to raise $35 million in Botswana. Uh, they were started there. With your help? With my help. Right. So what had actually happened is that uh, when they were starting up, they had an idea and a concept. And I came up and I helped them develop their business model. Um, I helped them deliver the business model and also just naming the institution to be called Value Chain, Value Chain Farming. I actually came up with it uh, and then they went on to Botswana, but I wasn't part of the Botswana initiative anymore, but they then went on to Botswana and using the business model that I had created, uh, which is just premised on very simple things really, uh, which is access to markets, access to information, and, um, uh, and, 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 and then access to capital. Mm. And they went into Botswana and they, 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 they raised uh, $35 million as a result. Mm. Um, and so they, those are like some of the clients that I, when I'm talking to my clients, I say, you know, I've actually worked with these guys and mm. they go online, they read about it and they actually discover, you know what, this guy's actually raised money as a result of some of the work that I'd put in. Mm. So yeah. Let, let me push you here. So what, what's, what value are you providing for your clients? Okay, so the value that I'm providing for my clients is that um, my clients are largely, I consider myself a voice that's trusted by entrepreneurs. So my clients are largely entrepreneurs. So my value proposition for them is to say, I help you navigate, and I'm a business growth strategist, let me put that there. I help you navigate the difficult challenges, and then I help you set, set you on, mm. on, a, on a growth trajectory. Mm. So the entrepreneurs that I've worked with have actually moved towards a growth trajectory. Mm. Um, so that's the, in general, the value that I, that I provide mm. to them. I, so 
are these young people that you're seeing, seeing coming to you with uh, these business proposals? It's, it's, mostly, it's mostly young people, yeah. absolutely. It's mostly young people. But now I'm getting uh, a bit of you know, older clients because of referrals. When, when someone says, you know what, we've seen um, the work that you're doing, it's amazing. Then someone says, you know what, I'm actually being advised by this guy. So mm -hmm. because of that, you know, it's also helping me grow my portfolio of clients. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, um, looking at uh, Yanaya, where they are right now, you know, I, I look at them and say, I hope one day they actually list on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. But maybe, you know, it's crazy thinking they should stay private and so, and so forth. How long do you think you'll be, you continue to work with them? Well, I think, um, um, I believe that um, uh, the owners still see value. Mm. Uh, Nyari still sees value in the work that I do. And as you talk about listing, we've actually you know, had a discussion about that. Yeah. Because uh, I'll tell you one thing. Even when we started uh, the factory, our ambition was always to list. Right now, we've got the energy company. Our ambition is also to list. Mm. So for me, the ambition has always been to list. Because when I look at, say, the, the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange, at some point in time, I think when I was doing my undergrad, there were like 75 counters listed on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. And I did a thesis on uh, asset bubbles and things like that. And there were 75 companies that were listed at that point in time. If you look fast forward, we're in 2021, we've got 55 companies that are listed there. Uh, so what that tells you is that in terms of uh, number of counters that are listed, they've actually gone down mm -hmm. by a significant uh, uh, percentage. And so when I look at it, I look at um, us as, as, as young people not taking advantage enough of the stock exchange. We always talk about uh, investing and there are a lot of retail mm -hmm. investment mm -hmm. activity mm -hmm. that's taking place now. But not many of us are talking about listing. So I'm that guy who wants to talk about listing. Mm -hmm. So when I look at my clients, I'm always pushing them towards uh, massive, massive growth ambitions. And then sometimes I do tend to be a little bit over ambitious, mm -hmm. but it does help when you've got clients who also carry the same ambition. Mm -hmm. And then you, you, you've got this ambition up there and then you always find a way of bringing it down mm -hmm. to a level where uh, you can have practical and actionable steps towards the, the, the great ambition. Mm. What's your kind of ideal client, the client that gets you absolutely excited and raring to go? Give me that profile. My, my kind of ideal client is one who's ambitious primarily. Yeah. One who is, who is willing to dream and also one who uh, understands that, uh, you know, I, neither I nor them know everything. Mm. So one of my, my, my strategies is actually premised on just simply asking questions. Mm. And then we simplify the, you know, we, if it's a challenge that's there, we simplify it and we bring it to a level where it can be executed. Mm. If it's mm. a big ambition and a dream, we then create simple steps. But one has to be mm. ambitious mm. Uh, to, 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 to start with. And you're ambitious mm. and you're willing to do the work. So mm. those are typically my clients. Those who are ambitious, who are willing to do the work. And also those who are willing to listen when we get feedback from the market. Because the mm. market will tell you one thing. Uh, you come in, you've got a business and you want to do one thing. The mm. market tells you a different thing. Mm. You've got to be able to do that. So mm. those who are willing to listen to the market and those who are also willing to, um, um, you know, at least uh, uh, take advice mm. from, from a third party. Mm. And, and um, are you finding that we, uh, we are an entrepreneurial society? particularly your generation, are you, are you finding that there's a, there's a lot of them that are ready to go or they are, what do you call them, bingas? <laughs> what, what do you, yeah. what's, what, what's your experience? So my experience is that uh, I think there is an entrepreneurial spirit that is moving around. I don't know if I may put it that, sure. put it that way. Um, a lot of young people want to be entrepreneurs, but they want to be entrepreneurs for one reason or the other. Uh, the bottom line is that obviously not everybody should and can be an entrepreneur. The biggest challenge that I see is that um, most of the entrepreneurs that are coming up are sort of transactionary. Uh, they are not, um, you know, trying to build generational wealth. Uh, they are also looking. Maybe it's part to do with the environment. They are also looking at, 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 at instant. You know, I've got to make instant mm. wins. So because of that, you look at there's a culture. I mean, I'll take you back to Jiwuta. You know, uh, there's a culture of of this. We want this instant. A success. We want something that just comes through and then we, 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 we are here today, we are there the next day. So people are not investing in their craft, they're not investing in trying to even understand the environment in which mm. they're trying to, mm. to, to operate their business. Mm. So you get someone comes through and says, you know, Shuruta, Shuruk Fire, and then, and, and then everybody flocks Everybody through. goes in And there. then someone comes through and says, my potato and saga, Shuruk Fire. Everybody comes through and wants to do potatoes in a sack. And then, so it's sort of, the th even the thinking that's happening with farming, I'm happy that uh, there's a lot of entrepreneurial activity happening in the farming space, but a lot of those young people want to get in there and they think they're going to make a million bucks the next day. But entrepreneurship will teach you realities and, and some of those realities are what I then speak to my entrepreneurs about.
Hmm. What does it take to be a successful young entrepreneur? Uh, well, I think success is, for me, success is, 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 is contextual. I think, um, um, you know, you've spoken about uh, Bafundi Mpofu, mm. who was your teacher who, mm. who, who gave you motivation, who saw something in you when everybody else didn't see. And I would think for Bafundi Mpofu, his success was seeing you succeed. And that was success for him. So I think success is a picture that we mm, paint. Mm, it's mm, a personal reality. Mm. So in terms of becoming a successful entrepreneur, um, I think it's, it, it comes down to what is it, you know, your, your key outcomes. What is it that you're expecting at the end of the tunnel? Mm. So each and every individual entrepreneur has got a, a social entrepreneur may not really be looking at the financial bottom line as success. Mm. They want mm. to make an impact, right? Mm. So it depends with the kind of entrepreneur that you are. But I notice uh, amongst the entrepreneurs that I advise, um, if we're talking financial success, that is. Yeah. Um, and if it, what makes a successful entrepreneur in most cases is, uh, there's, there are a lot of factors really. There's an issue around timing. Um, you know, I was watching one interview that you did with uh, uh, one of the people that I really look up to. I also look up to you, greatly look up oh, to you. thank you. So, uh, Nigel Chanakri mm -hmm. was talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the story of, of Kingdom Financial Holdings, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and when Kingdom Financial, um, um, in fact, Kingdom Equities transitioned to, into the banking space, it was because of an influx of customers that had come through as a result of the demutualization that mm -hmm. was happening at Old Mutual. It was timing. So what makes a successful entrepreneur? I think it's timing. I think there's a lot that the entrepreneur, inside the entrepreneur, they can do. So there's that sphere of influence where what they can control, uh, what they can influence, and then beyond what they can influence. And beyond what they can influence usually uh, attributes to a great deal of the entrepreneurial success. Mm -hmm. There's timing. Uh, there's, you know, some people, you know, I, I would call it grace. Some people call mm. it luck. Mm. It also adds to, 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 to eventually the success that an entrepreneur has. But I think for me, what happens is that we've often glamorized the, the entrepreneurial uh, stories, right? We, we paint a very simplistic narrative that excites and, and, and that sells. But most often than not, there are a lot more details that make up uh, yeah. the success of one entrepreneur when you compare one entrepreneur with the other. Um, you know, you, you talk about one entrepreneur who may have been given a chance, you talk about another entrepreneur who may have just, you know, started when, when it was the right time, you talk about another entrepreneur who gets in when another business that was operating in that same space was collapsing, and then they just took advantage. So there are a lot of these factors that make up an entrepreneur, but it's, it's, it's the attitude primarily, you know, they, most of the entrepreneurs that I know who've succeeded, they've planned for it, they've They've committed themselves, um, you know, to, 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 to doing so. I was talking to an entrepreneur. Um, his name is Smang. I met him recently, uh, and he does construction. And he was telling me that, you know, his philosophy is um, a relentless pursuit of, 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 of perfection. And, and like I mentioned earlier, for me, I believe that uh, passion is not project specific. It's who you are. So mm. most of those successful entrepreneurs are quite passionate. They are quite driven. And, and also sometimes they throw away, you know, the textbook theories and, and, and they go mm. on the ground and actually, you know, um, work on the ground with the realities that are there. Mm. And, and, and they always have a lens, a different lens to, to things. Mm. Where others see challenges, they are often looking at the challenge and saying that's an opportunity embedded in the challenge. Mm. So I think that's what makes up uh, some of these great entrepreneurs. Wow. And you, w w there's something that... Um, you say, which uh, I particularly like, and I want to, to get you to, to drill down further, that is wealth that is linked to work. Um, I get a sense that there's a generation out there right now that doesn't quite understand that concept, that, uh, you know, wealth that is linked to work is wealth that endures. Absolutely. Uh, and that overnight success, uh, you know, uh, does, does, not, does not sustain. What's your sense about that? Yeah, so I think um, when I look at, for example, the Zimbabwean environment, uh, you find that, um, i give you an example, when we were starting up with the manufacturing, yeah. how we struggled to convince uh, uh, the tax men that we wanted to volunteer to pay tax because they had a checklist that was not flexible enough for me mm. uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a business I was starting up to be able to pay tax voluntarily, mm. right? So when you find some of those issues that are there, you find that it becomes somewhat easier to, I say a conventional business for me is like Main Street mm -hmm. and then uh, rent seeking and everything else that happens is like the back door. So if the main door is somewhat logged mm -hmm. or it's difficult to open, sometimes people try and find the back door. Mm -hmm. But it's become a culture where the people that we celebrate, 
we celebrate people whose worth oftentimes cannot be explained by real work. It's not connected to, I've created X amount of employees, uh, you know, I've created X amount of value. There's no value that can be publicly spoken of. So because of that, these are the people that have sort of become role models. But also because we are not casting a light, and I'm glad that uh, your, your show in conversation with Trevor has done an immense, uh, you know, has put an immense effort into casting light onto entrepreneurs mm. and people who've actually built wealth that is linked to work. When I look at in conversation with Trevor, for me personally, I look at it as a masterclass, you know. Mm. It's, it's you. you know, because you are bringing entrepreneurs whom ordinarily we can't, we don't have access to. Mm. Recently, you, you know, anyway, I could list a number of entrepreneurs that you've brought, but th most of the I'd like to believe there's, there's wealth that is linked to work. They can tell you that, you know, I made my mind, I created X amount of jobs and I created X amount of value. I think that's important. Um, what, does, what does celebrating people that, whose, whose wealth we can't explain? I mean, I have problems with that, you know. You, you're driving fancy cars, you're living in big... But I, I can't quite trace where you made your money. But Absolutely. we celebrate those people. Why is that happening and what does that do to us? I think it's because, you know, by nature, uh, wealth that is um, not linked to work, uh, you, you know, it's it's more inclined to being glamorous, to being yeah. all that. And, and maybe when we talk about it, people say, ah, you know, he's just saying. But that is the truth. If you find work that is, wealth that is linked to work, I've found, because I do a lot of research, mm. I've found a great deal of people who've become quite successful. Uh, and, and when you look at them, there's a business there and there's employees there, there's infrastructure going up, there's real value that is going into mm. the, to the formal ecosystem. So for me, celebrating uh, people who have wealth that is not linked to wealth is a product of them. They step up, they step up. Mm. maybe more often than not, they step up and, and they make noise, they deliberately curate their yeah, stories, they're yeah. always making noise. And then those whose um, wealth is linked to work, because, you know, entrepreneurship by nature, it's not a straight line. You know, it, it goes up and down. They face challenges and they face difficulties. It's not as glamorous as the it, other thing. Exactly. Mm. And because it's not glamorous, a lot of people then, when they look at the overly critique, the, the challenges that in, in a proper entrepreneur was, was actually creating wealth that is linked to work, um, because they see things from a different view. They are all these multi dimensions of mm. looking at things, but they look at it from one dimension, yet the entrepreneurial journey is multi dimensional. Mm. So, because of that, we often then find ourselves vilifying uh, entrepreneurs, uh, or at least maybe not really understanding their journey. Because it does take long, mm. um, it, it does take a bit of time, mm. and when it when it does get to that point, it takes a bit of time. They're not your usual mingers. They're not throwing around money mm. in the street. They're not doing that. They're actually creating jobs. They've worked hard for their money, they've so they can't throw it on the street. Yes, and yeah. also they also believe that um, you've got to earn their money. Yeah. So you come in, they create a job for yeah. you. So they're creating value in that context. They're creating jobs. They're doing all of these mm. things that are that are that are uh, that people will look at as ordinary, mm. right? So, so when someone does and goes and puts, let's say, a traffic light because they feel you know they have, they've operated in a certain environment, mm. people just like you know they mm. won't talk about it. Mm. But when someone imports the latest car, people talk about it because you know people want th th tabloid and, and scandal sells more than mm. conventional. So mm. I think this is the challenge with. Tell, tell, tell me, very true indeed, tell me what's the right ecosystem to promote young entrepreneurs? What's the right ecosystem that will uh, encourage more young people to get into startups? From your experience, what, what ecosystem do we need to put in place to yeah. encourage uh, the emergence of more young uh, entrepreneurs and uh, more startups in our economy? Yeah, so my belief is that uh, we need to enrich the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, I know there are already participants and players that are already playing in that space. Uh, but like I said, entrepreneurship is multidimensional. So you need your, 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 your government in terms of regulation, mm. in terms mm. of financial mm. support mm. Uh, and funding. Uh, you need uh, private sector, venture, venture capitalists to come in and finance. Mm. But all of these uh, elements, they come in where there's value. And that value is a product of many issues. So you look at, um, I appreciate and applaud those who are already participating uh, by way of hubs and things like that. But I feel that those hubs are not properly structured. Okay. Let me explain how, mm. how that is the case. So if you look at, uh, if I'm a property owner and I start an entrepreneurial hub, my main goal really is to create an opportunity for rental space. Uh, I may explain it in one way or the other. 
but I'm not going to be able to create an ecosystem that really supports and helps entrepreneurs thrive because I'm primarily looking at my bottom line. So I'm one dimensional. I may mm. go and do other things that mm. support the entrepreneur, but I'm one dimensional. So from a bank, you know, I want entrepreneurs to come and open an account. Yeah. So right. So I'm looking at it for my interest. So I think one of the things that is critical for the entrepreneurial ecosystem to grow is a common interest. Because a common interest is one that brings in my interest, your interest, and so forth. Yeah. So when business is now looking at the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur is no longer the product. Mm. The entrepreneur is an opportunity to grow the business. Mm. How do I mean? If you are running a big conglomerate, right? If you want to do research and development, it's probably going to cost you millions, right? But I can do research and development for 30K. Mm -hmm. I can do research and development for 20K. Mm. And a startup can do research and development for 20K. But if you are a big conglomerate entity and you set up uh, on, on the entrepreneur and startup journey. Mm. Uh, you obviously want to duplicate uh, the structure that you have in your main business onto the startup, but a startup is not a micro version of a large corporation. Mm. So because a startup is not a micro version of a large corporation, what is re required to start up and to run a large corporation are completely different. There are different set of skills. So skills are number one. Okay. So now you find that those who are making an effort, appreciated, mm -hmm. they're doing a great job. But they're missing it in terms of they're trying to duplicate a structure that is now archaic and no longer relevant to the requirements and needs of the modern entrepreneur. So what are the needs of the modern entrepreneur? Mm. Obviously, they need funding, uh, they need uh, a mentorship, they need guidance, they need all of these things that are required to be able to mold and create it. But we have to be deliberate about mm. it. And, and part of being deliberate about it, you know, I've recently read a book by, um, um, I call him a mentor from a distance, Dr. McLean Spanda. Mm -hmm. He's written a book called uh, Boats and Nuts. Yes. And it speaks primarily about building Africa's first recognized innovation hub in South Africa. And, and, and the things that they had to put in together to be able to achieve that. So it's a collaborative effort because some, everyone is in it for their own interests. But once there's a common interest to say we can actually grow our economy uh, from the work that is being done by entrepreneurs and startups, then you know, we'll look at entrepreneurship from a more serious knot. Mm. If, we, if, if, I, if I'm a bank and I, and I look at entrepreneurs as a source of innovation for my business, I obviously, you know, look at entrepreneurship from uh, from beyond the transaction. Right. So entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial ecosystem currently is transactional. Everybody wants to get something immediately. Nobody's looking at the long term. Mm. So I do, do you think it's because of where we are right now, or it's because of who we are? I think it's a it's a, it's a mix of both. Okay. It's 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 where we are as an economy, uh, as a country. Uh, so you look at businesses, obviously, they don't have money to spare for long-term mm. investment. Mm. But they're also not looking at it from the context of if you are going to set up a new venture within your, your organization, you're probably going to hire a CEO who's going to need a car, mm. who's going to need all mm. of those things. Mm. But if you invest that money through startups that are high-growth startups, mm. and, and people like us can help you vet and mm. see that this is a high-growth startup. Mm. So if you're going to invest in, in a high-growth startup, uh, they're a source of, of, uh, of, of new innovation. And, and also they do it you know, because most of them are using the lean startup methodology, which mm. means they're not, you know, consuming a great deal of resources and they're not paying themselves these humongous paychecks. Mm. So because of that, uh, I feel that it's, it's you know, um, it's about bringing all of these uh, skills and also recognizing that, yes, it's, it's who we are, it's where we are, but it's also a culture issue. Right. So I call it a culture issue in the context that there is instant gratification. Everybody yes, wants something to yes. happen now. Mm. And then those sometimes who are sitting on, on money, they're look at, looking at entrepreneurs not as people they can collaborate with. They're looking at them as people they can replace. Right. So in the developed world, you look at your Facebook. Facebook could have created WhatsApp, but they, they didn't. They went and bought startup. Mm. So you look at all of these other entities. They reinvent through startups. Right. They don't move in and say, you know what, we've gotten your idea, you've come to us with a pitch, so we're taking it, we're running with it without you. Mm. They say, you know what, the vision and the visionary at inception are not, you can't separate them mm. initially. At, at inception, the vision and the, and the visionary are like one. Mm -hmm. So because of that, when you then go into, into, into the Zimbabwean entrepreneurial ecosystem, people are trying to replace each other. They're not mm. realizing the value of collaboration, that you know, you know, all of us are more brilliant than 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 yes, a single person. Than a single yeah. person, right? So when we collaborate and we come to a point of common interest, because at that point of inter where common interests intersect, mm. that's where we create value. And once we create value, then people can win, you know. And and some of the immediate gains that people actually want may not come through using the methods and approaches they are using, but they may actually come through 
by going the route that appears to be long term, mm. but it actually delivers uh, much more uh, uh, immediate results. Because what's, I've what's what's the for, for you? What's the biggest hurdle to uh, having more start startups come up? Is it is it is it political? Is it economic? Is it uh, finance? What, what what is it? It's a, it's a mix of a lot of things. Okay. I think it, I could list some of the things that you've sure, mentioned, absolutely. but I also, mm. it's, it's skills, right? Yeah. I did an undergrad, uh, and when I was doing my undergrad, uh, I learned a great deal about business and so forth. But when I was now getting into the startup scene, I've had to learn a whole new, even vocabulary, I'll tell you that. I've had to learn a whole new vocabulary, and so it seems that um, it's a mix of a, for, 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 for a lot of these things. The hubs, some of the hubs mm. uh, that are there, they may not have the skills because I'll tell you, in a functional economy, you, if you are starting a hub, you've got to have an, a, a, an entrepreneur and a residence. Mm. If you're starting up, if, if you're a big organization, a big corporation, and you're going in there, you're starting up, you've got entrepreneurs coming in a lot. Mm. Because there's a difference. Say, I walk into a bank today, there's mm. a whole difference between what uh, the checklist and the standard template that's at the bank mm. and what I can offer. But I can still offer value. Mm. But because the template, does not, mm. you know, it's, it's not tailored for me. And even when I try to adjust myself to the template, it still does not quite align. So because of all of those issues, uh, it's the environment, it's the economy, it's the skills, it's the culture, it's, it's, it's a whole lot of issues mm. that, are, that, are, that are sort of standing in the way of, it's also an issue of, of sometimes when people come up with solutions, right, that they think they're solving certain problems. Yeah. And in some cases, some of the solutions are cosmetic. Why? Because they solve problems that actually are not big enough. So in entrepreneurship, we, or in the startup space, what we do is that we try and validate the problem first. Yeah. Then once we validated the problem, we try to validate the solution. Uh, is the problem big enough? Is, 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 you know, describe the problem for us. Tell us how big the problem is. Can you, can you put a number onto the problem? Can you mm. say this problem is causing X amount of loss? So sometimes I've seen some pitch competitions. Someone just comes through and they try to solve a problem. It doesn't quite move forward. Why? Because mm. It's not speaking directly to, to the context. So it's an issue also of context. Sometimes you copy and paste without mm. contextualizing. And when we do that, we don't quite move forward uh, in, in the same direction. Because you can't also then copy the environment. You can't copy Silicon Valley, mm. right? You can't copy the environment and paste it into the map. You copy the solution, but then the environment mm. is different. So we've got to start building for context. And I like that some of the entrepreneurs that, I, that I'm working with, you know, I talk about need energy. Yeah. They've recently raised uh, uh, some money in Australia. Uh, with startup boot camp, and it's happening. I mean, I've seen uh, last week. I think there's a Zimbabwean uh, entrepreneur who works with an entity called uh, um, Imali Pay, I think, and they recently raised money from Google. Uh, so it's happening. Zimbabwean entrepreneurs, even when they export themselves or when they export their their businesses outside Zimbabwe, uh, are doing fairly well. So we've got to try and then figure out if mm. it's if it's the environment, what can we fix there? Yeah. If it's the skill set. What can we fix what needs there? to be done? Yeah, and, and yeah. that sort of thing. So you, you, you've, you've had a number of interesting um, encounters in your life or experiences. Um, and one of them was, uh, you, you say, spending a day with uh, Aliko Dangote, Africa's uh, richest man. Oh, yeah. uh, how did that come about and what impact did it have on you? Oh, yeah. So one of my, um, I don't know whether I could call it my, my secret powers. Let me put it that way is that I volunteer for stuff. I like to volunteer for stuff. So when I see something that's happening, like recently I saw uh, there's a Zimbabwean entrepreneur who wants to raise 1,000 entrepreneurs. I've already connected with him. Mm. I've already told him, you know what, I, I want to be part of this. Shingi so, Mnyeza. Yes, <laughs> Dr. Shingi, yes. Yeah. So yeah, I've, I've actually engaged with him in that respect. So what happens is that when I see something that's happening and it's positive, I try and, uh, and also I'm always creating value online. Mm. So if you check how I create my content online, I always try to create value and, and post that. Yeah. So one of these I'm, days I'm online, and then a good friend of mine who now happens to be my sister, Josima Hachi, uh, wants to do something in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. At that particular time, it's something that I could not do. Mm. Uh, well, at least in terms of uh, um, my, my, you know, if, if I were to look at where, where I was at that point in time, I probably wasn't able to do it. But then she calls me up, and then I say, wait a minute, but who am I? And then I realized, you know what, I have to try. And then I did, and I actually did what she, you know, I helped her with what she wanted assistance with. So she then realized that, you know what, I've got a resource in Zimbabwe. So when the Dao Dangote thing happens through, and then there's the build up, I'm a little bit involved somewhere in there, and then eventually he comes through, and guess who, Jose calls through to come through for the, for the meetings. I appear. So we go to the airport in the morning, we pick him up, 
and it, and it's really mind blowing. You know, I here I am I, on that particular day. I, I think I probably didn't even even have five rand in my pocket, but here I am on that particular day. You know, I'm at the airport picking up um, Africa's richest man, Africa's most celebrated industrialist. A, a man whose wealth is linked to the work that is mm. done. We see the businesses that is done. We see Dangote uh, uh, cement in Zambia and Dollar. We see all of the things that he's doing. And then I get to spend a day with him, literally get, going into every office that he went. I was there, whether it was going to the then president. What did that to do to you? It was mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Talk it was, to me about it was that. mind blowing, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, what was most mind blowing was seeing him in action. Mm -hmm. You know, he brought a team with him. As, as rich and as, 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 as celebrated as he is, he brought a team with him whom he was talking to and listening to. One, he quickly made decisions. If there was a decision that needed to be made, he wasn't like a ah, bureaucrat and so forth because he had his team whom he relied on. And the, him being this guy, and even in, during the meetings, even just whispering to, to one of his guys and, and seeing that he's actually consulting, it was amazing for me to say, oh wow, he actually consults his team. Um, and then the other thing was his humility. I would suppose maybe from where I was standing, I could see, uh, so maybe I may have a different picture of it, but I, I looked at him and, and I saw uh, you know, some great humility. I also saw someone who was well invested in what they were doing mm. and, and he knew exactly what he wanted mm. to do when he came to Zimbabwe. And, 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 and well, for, for some reason, people may look at it differently, but I saw a different view because I was having a very close up. I mean, mm. I mean this is a guy I had lunch with. I mean, you're having lunch with a billionaire, you don't have five rand in your pocket. It must be mind blowing. <laughs> so for me, it was also validation for me, uh, being in the same room there and, and just thinking to myself, I mean, I was born in rural Shamba Madziwa. I mean, what am I doing in this mm. room? So mm. for me, that also gave me some sort of validation in terms of uh, um, where I want to go. And I talk about listing a lot. I talk about listing a lot even when I talk about some of the entrepreneurs that I work with. Because where I want to go, I want to list. Mm. That, that's what I want to do. Okay. And, yeah. and then your assignment with, with Caps United in 2013? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. My assignment with Caps United was uh, full of drama. Caps United, the football club, eh? Absolutely. Yeah. Zimbabwe talk to is me one, about that. One of the top three yeah. big clubs in Zimbabwe. Yeah. So, you know, because I... My head is always spinning with solutions and I want to solve things, I want to solve things, yeah. I want to solve things. So I see the club is struggling financially at that point in time. And I see and I realize, you know what, they could be making money from X, Y, and Z. So what do I do? I then approach them. And then I went and I did a pitch. And immediately after they, I do a pitch, you know, these guys were mind blown. They're like, I mean, they're looking at this kid and he's pitching, you know, to them that I can help you make money. Mm. You know, I didn't have money at that point in time. And I told them, I gave them a figure and I said, I'm going to help you make this amount of money this year. And if you allow me to do X, Y, Z, I'll give you this value. But I also take this amount mm -hmm. back. So, yeah, I go in there. Uh, but I say it was full of drama because at that particular point in time, I actually didn't have a car. So, you know, we would get, we would get VIP tickets to the stadium, right? So I then go to a Caps United football match at the National Sports Stadium. I get a VIP ticket because we're supposed to, with a media team that we'd also build around to try and help create a revenue from non core activities. So I go there with my team. And so I either, I either had to be the first one out of the stadium mm -hmm. or the last one out, mm. primarily because I didn't have a car. Mm. Why? Because I didn't want these players to lose respect for me. Here I was telling them that I could help them make money and, and, and what was I doing? So. One of those days that I then go to the stadium, for some reason, these guys just don't leave the stadium. And, I, and, and I'm thinking, why don't you just leave so that, you know, you know, you know. So that you, I walk out so that I without walk you out. seeing me. Without you seeing me. So they don't leave the stadium. So what do we do? We decide, mm. ah, guys, you know what, I think we've stayed long enough. Let's just, you know, let's, let's exit in the quickest way possible. So here we are, we, 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 you know, we're heading out towards the gate. We realize, you know what, the gate is even further than there's, a, there's an opening on, on, on the Jurao. Like one of the Jurao is, uh, the panels have fallen off. There's an opening. We realize, you know what, this is a quicker exit route. So we exit via the, 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 the opening where the, the panels had fallen off. We quickly hike and we leave. And so I always talk to my, my friends and I say, do you remember that day when we, when we went out of National Sports Stadium? We didn't go through, out through the gate. We actually went through the wall because you know, we didn't want the players to see us. Uh, you know. But for us, it wasn't about who we were. For us, it was about the value that we were going to create for them. They saw value in what we offered, mm. right? And because they saw value in what we offered, they didn't care who we were. They also didn't care mm. whether we had money or not, but we were able 
to come in and and, and did you create value for them we did create value mm -hmm. we did create value we did encounter some challenges obviously but we did create value and i know i think if i'm not mistaken one of the recommendations that we had made was uh, uh, was a strategic decision around relocating from the stadium uh, they were playing at the national sports stadium mm -hmm. and i had a strong feeling that it was not strategic for them because most of their fans were coming either from shitungiza either from glenview high food and faculty high Glen area and for them to go to National Sports Stadium was two combis away. Mm -hmm. And for me, I said to, to myself, I think their ticket was around $3 or whatever it is. And then I said to them, you know what, if you want to fill up the stadium, because I remember some of the matches would have like a thousand people in the stadium. And I said to them, if you want to fill up the stadium, you've got to be where the people are. Mm -hmm. Your stadium is not ideally located, you know, because someone who wants to come and watch your match has to have three bucks in their pocket to be able to come and watch your match. If it was three bucks, it was five bucks. Can't quite remember the figure, but they have to have that figure in their pocket to come and watch your match. They also have to have an additional, whether it's if you're coming from Chitungiza, they've got to have two combis, mm. uh, access to be able to get to two com board two combis to reach you, two combis again to get back home. And a lot of people were not prepared to do that. And I said, the money that they're using to just travel to come and see your, your, your match is money that they could actually be paying whilst they are, you know, they, are, they could literally walk from Glenview and into Guanzura. So I advised that, you know what, why don't you go back to Guanzura? Mm. Where someone can walk from Glenview and, and come and watch your match. Someone can just have one combi from Shtungiza and come and watch your match. Someone can walk from Bari and come and watch your match. Because football, obviously... And they did that. And they did that, yeah. but um, I think they did that in the next season, which is the 2014 season. Unfortunately, I was no longer because there was a bit of, I think, change in management there, mm -hmm. uh, and then. And um, you made money yourself. We d we d no, we didn't make money. I'll be honest money. with you. We, d yeah. we didn't make money, but we did create value. Okay. Uh, some of the ideas that we we had were not fully implemented, mm -hmm. uh, and then there were other issues around mm. uh, the implementation of the ideas. Uh, mm. But we did create traction for ourselves. Mm. Um, money, we didn't make money. You didn't make money. Yeah. You, you, you also, the, um, you're also a Mandela uh, Washington fellow. Um, what, what's, what's, what's been the, uh, the takeaway from that experience? For me, uh, the fellowship was an opportunity for me to be exposed to best practice, to be exposed to an environment that mm. has advanced in terms of the startup scene, let me put it that way, that is advanced in terms of their entrepreneurial uh, exploits. So for me, the exposure, I mean, I, I, I had an opportunity to, to visit John Deere, I had an opportunity to go to Frontier Co-op, a, a rural cooperative business that does, I think, $500 million in turnover, but it's owned by rural farmers, mm. right? Um, I had an opportunity to see all of those things and to engage with the CEOs and to engage with, 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 with some of the, the, the business leaders uh, in, in those institutions and to even be able to take a tour. I remember when we went to uh, Collins Aerospace, uh, we were able to take a tour at, at one of the, uh, they were talking about it, I think it's not yet out as a technology for the, for, the, for the cockpit, but it's something that they were testing. It was in bit of mode and then we saw it and we experienced it. Uh, we went and, and saw a Tesla vehicle that was being reconstructed so for me, it was just that exposure and also mm. access to the African market mm. because now I've got um, maybe access to almost every African country. We registered a network. A network. We registered a business. Mm. We were trying to duplicate our manufacturing business here in South Sudan because they've recently emerged from a, mm. a, a, a civil war situation, uh, and we've ab been able to do that because we've got someone whom we can call and mm. say, uh, you know, I'm a registered company. I'm coming. I'm doing this, mm. and then you know they make that uh, thing happen. So for me, it's establishing a network, mm. but it's also establishing a network of clients because mm. now I, I advise uh, one of my clients actually recently won an award in the USA, uh, and I advise them they are in West Africa. And one thing that fascinates me about West Africa is that when I'm talking to someone in West Africa, uh, especially if they're asking me for advice and things mm -hmm. like that, or if I'm, if I'm consulting for them, you know, I, it's, it's mind-blowing the work ethic and the mentality and the mindset that they have. It's completely... Compared to ours. Yeah. So for me, I had to go to the U.S. to be able to meet some of these guys. And, and so for me, the fellowship was an opportunity for me to interact and, mm -hmm. and be able to, to see uh, other entrepreneurs from the African mm -hmm. continent, how they think, the challenges that they're going through, uh, and, and also just uh, getting you know, a new mm -hmm. uh, refreshing look at, 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 mm -hmm. at the do, do, you, do you regret not uh, finishing your MBA? Because you are an, you're an MBA dropout like yeah. me. I dropped out. <laughs> eh? I, yeah. I tried uh, MBA at WITS, and uh, I think I quit after... Uh, one session because I found there was a lot of young people around me and I, I really was battling and I decided MBA is not for, is not for me. So you you quit uh, you dropped out of the MBA and uh, out of uh, ACA. Do you regret that? 
Um, ACA, well, because for me, the natural progression was from banking, being a banker, uh, to, uh, progressing into, because by the time that I enrolled for banking, the banking industry was the industry to be in. Mm. Everyone wanted to be in the banking industry. I wanted to be in the banking industry, obviously, because I think there was the money print, printing stuff and you know, guys in the banking seemed to be doing very well at that point in time. Um, so I then it, tried to do ACA because it was a natural progression from, from mm. finance to accounting. Mm. Uh, but I then realized that, that wasn't me. My colleague is actually, whom I enrolled with, has actually completed, uh, I think he completed a few years ago. Um, and then the MBA, I do mm. regret in what context. So I've been approached because I've got a different approach and a different take to, mm. to entrepreneurship. Uh, one that is um, uh, you know, premised on my experiences, my failures, and, and, and the experiences of those that I've you know, been advising and guiding along. So because I've got that, I then was appro approached by a local university. They wanted me to come and teach. They didn't want me to be a, an entrepreneur in residence, which I have gladly accepted. So they wanted me to come and teach because they had seen me at some point and they were like, who's this guy? Mm. So they approached me and then they said, send me your CV. So I was going to do it part time. And I felt, you know, uh, even in the developed world, your Peter Thiel mm. was, was a lecturer at Stanford, mm. right? And, and these are people who have gone on to build multi-million dollar ventures. So I thought, you know what, let me go and offer my time. So I sent, sent them in my CV. They discover that, you know, I haven't done my MBA. So they call me up and say, ah, so what happened? Yeah, and then I tell them, you know, I didn't finish my MBA. So they say, ah, no, we're looking for someone who's got a master's. So in that context, because, you it. In, because people in Zimbabwe, mm. they really look at the paper qualification as, mm. you know, ahead of every, everything else. You, whatever you've done, they forget about it. They say, where's your paper qualification? Mm. So because of that, I regret it because I've lost out on opportunities because of uh, uh, that um, I've done, tried to enroll for an MBA that I now believe in. I think it's called the Quantic MBA mm. uh, because it's 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 con unconventional. So I've actually done ten percent of the content there. So mm. hopefully I'll be able to actually enroll for the main uh, program. We wish you the and best with with that. Yeah. Tell tell me, where do you see yourself in the next ten years? The vision for me has always been. I don't know whether I'm going to create the ten thousand jobs as 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 Chad or I'm going to help people. I'm going to create the ten thousand jobs. But uh, I believe that there's a vision that has been planted in my heart. And that vision is to create 10,000 jobs. Mm. Uh, so I see myself listing. I want to list so bad. I want to list a company uh, for legacy. I want to list a company to, to, to dedicate to, you know, f I, I don't know. I would just want to list a company. So mm. I see myself in the next 10 years being participating in the listing of, of one or two uh, companies. I mean, it troubles me that uh, we're not listing companies, mm. you know, fast enough, mm. whether it's in Zimbabwe, you know, we, we're doing something in Malawi. And you find in Malawi, there's like, I think, 15 companies that are listed on the stock exchange. It's insane. Mm. So I want to help someone list. I want to, 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 to list. Mm. Yeah. Tell me, what's, apart from failing with uh, your first company that you went into, well, what, what failure has uh, totally humbled you? Well, um, I think it's... I think the dissolution of the partnership, I'll take it back to that. It, yeah. You know, because you go into a business with all of these ambitions because mm. I, I, I'm not I'm not like someone who wants to get the dollar today. Mm. I, I want to build something for the okay. long term. So that failure was, was totally humbling to me mm. because I thought I had done everything that I needed to do mm. to keep the business afloat. But upon reflection, and that's the beauty of reflection, upon reflection, then I realized I could have done better here, mm. I could have done better there. So for me, that was like uh, one of the... Uh, most humbling uh, experiences, yeah. What, what message do you have to your generation regarding where the continent is and where Zimbabwe is? Well, I think I, I would like to borrow my message from the fact that, uh, um, you know, we spoke about who was linked to work, um, that not all hard work brings wealth and not all wealth is linked to hard work. But you've got to be someone who chooses something. You've got to be, have your values. I've got my own value systems. People know I've walked away from certain rooms where my values, where, where I don't align with the values, even mm. when there's money on the table. Uh, a lot of people ask me, why aren't you rich yet? I could have been rich if I had wanted to take a shortcut. But I think you've got to be someone who reflects. You've got to be someone who looks at the deeper inner, inner being. And I think some of the values that I was taught uh, by my parents have allowed me to, to remain uh, focused and committed to the end game to the vision that I have. Mm. Uh, and I know some people may not see it, but I see it and I, and I see it boldly. Um, I'll give you an example of something that um, I learned from a man called Lebo Gungluza, who now happens to be a, a board member at UNISA. Lebo told me this thing. He says to me, 
when God created men, he created them in three forms. It was the body, the mind, and the spirit. So obviously the body will look different. So it's, mm. not, the, it's not the body that looks mm. like God. It's not, it's not the mind because his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, mm. right? But it's the spirit because the spirit can navigate and go beyond the, ex the, period, the present mm. moment. So my spirit has already traveled and I've seen the future by God's grace, right? And so that's what entrepreneurs are about. They are about casting their eyes and seeing into the future and, 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 and staying true to the present moment and being, staying true to your values. So I, my advice to, to young entrepreneurs and anyone else who's staying is to stay true to your values, mm -hmm. but uh, if, if it's, that's on a person or not. And then when it comes to entrepreneurship, I think it's uh, b before you, 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 you scale it, uh, you've got to discover, you've got to validate, then you scale. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't be excitable about the trends uh, of Chiruku Fire Chi, because Chiruku Fire Chi is like lightning, right? You know when you hear the sound of lightning, yeah. it has already struck, yeah. right? So Chiruku Fire Chi is like lightning. Uh, and also Chiruku Fire Chi does, is not really something that you can build uh, a business beyond your first name. It's not something that you can build your legacy around. Wow, yeah. that's powerful. Okay. Uh, that's powerful, Chad. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I know you love books like me. Let's take a short break here and get on to our books. So, Chad, what books have you read which uh, you would want to recommend to our book-loving audience? I read a lot of books. Yes, you, you know? do. Yes, you yeah, do. You know, um, but I've, I've got, I think, um, I'll mention three or four yeah. or, or books that I've read. Uh, the first book was obviously Rich Dad Poor Dad. It, it, it was, it was mind blowing when I read it. Mm. It helped me, uh, you know, understand that, um, you know, conventional wisdom is not always, you know, um, what it seems. Um, so that was a Rich Dad Poor Dad. I've also read Lynchpin. Lynchpin because it, it sort of connects with me. Mm. Uh, you know, for me, my philosophy is that your work does not represent how much you got paid to do it. It represents you. So when I do work, it's me who's done the work. So for me, passion is not project specific. So when, when you look at Lynchpin, it talks about passion. It talks about uh, uh, creating human connections in the, the relentless pursuit of, of, of excellence. So Lynchpin uh, by Seth Godin, mm. I connect with that book. And then I've also read uh, From Rex to Riches, The Story of Abu Dhabi. From Rex to Riches, The Story of Abu Dhabi is a, is a non-academic book. It's more like a, a, a biography of some sort. Mm. Um, but it has actually been included, I think, in the educational curriculum of the UAE, which is one of the things that we've missed here. We've only got academic books in the curriculum. So that book speaks about the story of, of, of UAE and Abu Dhabi. And I am fascinated by the story of Abu Dhabi. It connects with the Zimbabwean story in one way or the other. Uh, and then I've read Lee Kun Yu's book, uh, um, The Singapore Story. Mm. Lee Kun Yu took over Singapore when they had nothing, mm. right? They had no natural resources. They had no currents of their own. Even their army was, was being paid by, by, I think, the British government mm -hmm. at that point in time. Mm -hmm. They had nothing. And they had to reconstruct and construct deliberately and carefully do so. Uh, build the Singapore uh, uh, economy and build a nation. They literally mm -hmm. built a nation in terms of uh, uh, creating common values uh, and building a nation from, from a, an economic backwater mm -hmm. to a plus $300 billion GDP uh, economy. And also, uh, they then built uh, Singapore to become the world's second biggest port uh, in terms of by volumes of, of business. And uh, they created Singapore into, from having no currency, to become one of the top five, I think, global financial centers. Mm. So I read that book and it was absolutely mind blowing. And also, it helped me understand that sometimes your vision, you've got to be disciplined, you've got to stick on to that vision. And sometimes people may not see it because yeah. early days, Lee Kun Yu had some criticism, but he had, uh, uh, he, he forged along. Mm. Um, I think I've said what yeah, books. you have, you <laughs> have. So Chad, you brought me this book. Thank you so much. I hope uh, everybody c who comes to, to this show realizes that Chad brought a book. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for, for, for this book, uh, uh, Chad. Um, uh, I look forward to reading it. Uh, but why have you brought me this book? You know, like when I was searching for a book, because I know you love books, when I was searching for a book, I was actually looking for a book that you hadn't read yet. And hopefully this is a 2021 book. I hope that you... I haven't read it. You haven't read it. <laughs> yeah. But the most, the, the, what, the biggest reason why I actually brought this book is because you've, you've made a pivot to digital. You're one of the first people, I think, in the media space, you are the first mainstream uh, media business in Zimbabwe to go uh, digital. And because of that, uh, this is a book that talks about surviving 
uh, digital and actually moving in, 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 the, in navigating the digital space. So I hope that it's an asset to you and I hope that it inspires you. Uh, so that's why I brought the book. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Chad. Thanks thank, a lot. Thank you so much for thank having you. me. Thank All you. Right. You know, you, you, I've said this to you uh, publicly that uh, for me, you um, represent uh, the beauty that is in your generation. Thank you. Uh, focused, thank um, you. persevering, um, passionate. Um, I see you going places and I wish you, thank you. all the very best. And I'm hoping that uh, uh, this conversation inspires your generation to focus on uh, wealth that's linked to work. Thank you. Rather than the bingas. Is that what they're called? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So, Chad, thank you so much. I don't take uh, uh, for granted your, your coming to, to, to us to, to have this conversation. It's been a quality conversation, inspirational. I don't quite understand 50% uh, of what you've said. It goes above <laughs> me, but nonetheless, I'm sure it's going to inspire quite a lot. So, Chad, thank you so much. Thank um, you so much for rooting for, for, the, for the guy on the street. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. It's an absolute pleasure. Allow me now, Chad, turn to our audience who are in Zimbabwe, who are on the continent and... Um, all over the world who follow this conversation on a weekly basis. We are out uh, on YouTube, 7 a.m. Central African time. To ensure that you never miss any of these quality conversations, I invite you to click on this red button and uh, you subscribe. When you subscribe, you'll get an alert every time we have one of these quality conversations. So thank you for watching. But also, we've also gone beyond uh, just this video. Click, uh, if you roll down, uh, this video, you will find a link to our podcast for your listening pleasure. Thank you so much for your support. Until next time, cheers to you all.